Um, this is uh, a really great topic, uh, and we have a tremendous panel. I'll introduce the first panelist from here, and then I'll have a seat. And that first panelist is Brittany McCoy. Uh, Brittany is the director, the Climate Analysis and Strategies Branch, uh, and that's in the Office of Transportation and Air Quality at the United States Environmental Protection Agency. Brittany, thanks for joining us today. I'll turn it over to you. Here we go. So uh, thanks for inviting me to be a part of this uh, transportation panel discussion. Um, it's really an honor to, to sit here and talk about accelerating sustainable transportation. Uh, from an EPA perspective, I'm going to just kind of highlight three key things to talk about uh, really quickly. Um, our Clean School Bus Program, which I believe my director spoke about last year this time, uh, the U.S. National Blueprint for Transportation Decarbonization effort, and then as well as our Green Vehicle Guide website. So um, last year, uh, we had just opened up the first um, Clean School Bus funding opportunity under the Bipartisan Infrastructure Law. Um, and at the time, we received about 2,000 applications requesting about $4 billion, but we only had funding for $1 billion. We're doing $1 billion a year, so for over 12,000 buses. So ultimately, we selected about 400 applicants in that process um, and more than 2,400 buses, many which are electric, but also we have a number of propane as well as CNG buses in that first funding period. Um, many of the recipients of that funding, what I want to highlight, um, it was their first time receiving an electric bus. Um, so navigating the charging infrastructure installation was quite difficult. So we worked closely with the Department of Energy uh, and Transportation Joint Office um, to really help them navigate that uh, with technical assistance, answering questions, um, whether also hosting webinars about fleet analysis, uh, route planning, and just how to navigate infrastructure installation. So we'll continue to um, advance and revise that program design based on lessons learned, feedback, and welcome suggestions to our Clean School Bus, uh, Clean School Bus program through our mailbox, which is at cleanschoolbus at epa.gov. The second thing I want to highlight, which kind of speaks to this as well, is that um, our president, um, has really always been about, uh, in his early days in office, about climate change being a major priority. And so in January of 2022, he issued an executive order calling for this whole of government approach to address climate change and kind of put the U.S. on this path for achieving net zero emissions by 2050. And so that whole of government approach really starts with the federal government um, being role models to, to industry, but also um, um, uh, you know, within our own selves. So in 2022, later that year in, in uh, September, uh, EPA, uh, Department of Transportation, Department of Energy, as well as the um, Housing and Urban Development, we signed an MOU to kind of formalize this commitment, basically to work together to ensure that the nation's transportation clean technology transition is affordable, equitable, and kind of keeps moving forward. So then earlier this year, in January of 2023, we published the U.S. National Blueprint for Transportation Decarbonization. And really, that blueprint really envisions this kind of future mobility system that is clean, safe, secure, accessible, affordable, equitable, and provides decarbonized transportation options for people and goods. Um, it kind of starts with this thinking more broadly about how and why uh, we move people, how we move goods. Um, and it continues across all aspects of the transportation system. One thing I wanted to highlight were three key strategies from that blueprint. We talk about um, convenient, which is the first one, efficient, second, and then third is clean. And that just speaks about convenient. How do we improve community design and land use planning, hence why we have HUD involved in this effort. Efficient, how do we increase options to travel and, and um, to travel more efficiently? And then clean, which EPA has done fairly well with this, how do we transition and think about cleaner technologies, including zero emission techn vehicles as well as fuels? Um, so we are uh, currently working to kind of stay, to set the stage for initiating actions that enable um, convenient, equitable, zero carbon based transportation system by um, kind of setting these ambition, ambitious goals and achievable regulatory emission targets, um, hence by leveraging bill uh, and um, the Inflation Reduction Act investments as well. And so the last thing I want to highlight um, is while EV investment is important, regulatory uh, actions, because EPA is a regulatory agency, is important, it's really going to require just a little bit more than just putting EVs on the road and installing stations to be successful. Um, effective communication as well as consumer education is essential to that. And we've done that in a number of ways. We have our automotive, um, annual automotive trends report, 
which is basically an industry benchmark for how we think about uh, vehicle trends, fuel economy trends in the automotive in industry that relies on nearly 50 years of EPA test data. We also have our Green Vehicle Guide, which was launched in 2001, that basically provides the opportunity to serve as a um, place for consumers to get accurate, accessible information on EVs, fuel economy, and transportation decarbonization, to name a few. Um, so we have things like you can learn how to charge or let your vehicle. You have a comparison tool to look at comparing um, gas ve gasoline vehicles to electric vehicles. We revamp um, how we talk about hydrogen in transportation. Um, and then recently, our EV Myths page uh, to, to kind of address miscommunication of EVs is our most viewed site, um, which consistently has been making its rounds on social media and blogs um, and uh, articles as well. So we've been proactive and being intentional in trying to like communicate to the general public um, uh, information that may not may be common for us being in the industry we work in, um, but doesn't translate necessarily to the everyday user. Um, so I'll kind of end with that. Um, as my initial talking points. Thanks, Dan. That's great. That's a great place to start. Thank you so much. Um, our second panelist is Genevieve Cullen. Genevieve is the president of the Electric Drive Transportation Association. Genevieve, always a delight to see you. Take it away. Successfully managed. I think it was. Now I see the light. Yes, I work in technology. Uh, uh, good afternoon. I'm Genevieve Cullen. As, uh, as Daniel said, I'm the president of the Electric Drive Transportation Association. We are a cross-industry trade association representing the value chain of electric transportation. And by electric transportation, I mean anything in which electricity moves the wheels. So it's, it's, it's battery electric, it's hybrid, it's plug-in hybrid, and it's fuel cells. Uh, my members include vehicle manufacturers of all sizes, electric utilities, component and materials suppliers, as well as infrastructure developers. So we are together a gathering and advocating a collective vision for building the EV ecosystem. And as, as Brittany pointed out, it's more than just putting cars on the road. We have to build a whole ecosystem. Um, and, and while we're doing that, the 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 other benefits are uh, building U.S. competitiveness in a global uh, race to lead in this technology in this marketplace. We're creating jobs, we're reducing greenhouse gas emissions, and we're creating clean and cheaper transportation op options for, for families, businesses, and communities. Um, and so, because it's late in the afternoon and you've been listening to a lot of speakers, I'm just going to just deluge you with a whole bunch of numbers for a minute. So hang on, it'll be over. Um, I think most of you are aware of some of these projections, but it's just important to know, because a lot of people talk about inflection point and uh, a, a couple of factoids useful to know. Uh, so Bloomberg, New Energy Finance, uh, projects that EV sales will increase uh, from 10.5 million last year to 27 million in 2026. Um, and the, uh, the EV share of new global new passenger vehicle sales pro projected to rise from 14% in 2022 to 30% in 2026. In the United States, those numbers are growing pretty fast as well. So there are 3.8 million, maybe a little bit more since they tallied the no monthly numbers, uh, vehicles sold since 2010. Um, and in May of this year, there were uh, 113 and change plug-in vehicles were sold, and that's 68% increase over May of last year. Um, and so the U.S. sales are supposed to, are expected to grow from 7.6% of passenger vehicles uh, in 2022 to 28% by 2026. It's, it's a big jump. At the same time, we have to be building out infrastructure According to the Department of Energy, there's uh, about currently 64,000 public stations um, in operation, and Tesla has, you might have read about this, has committed to making at least 3,500 of its supercharger stations and 4,000 level two charging stations, charging docks uh, available to all EV drivers by the end of next year. Uh, across the EUS supply chain, there are investments that are totally more than 210 billion since 2021. Okay, you take a deep breath, that's all the numbers for now. Um, 
And what this, what this points to is a growing place in the EV market. Uh, it speaks to competitiveness and our climate goals, but it also means a lot just for consumers. On, on the market side, it's really important to note that, that there are 87 models of plug-in or electric drive vehicles available today. That'll be well over 100 uh, by 2027. And it's cheaper, it's cleaner, um, it's, uh, I would also point out, cheaper to maintain as well as to drive. Um, and it's, uh, in addition to the benefits for consumers, uh, obviously we know that there are national security benefits as have been talked about. All of, these, all of these efforts, this market growth is reinforced by historic and existing programs, IRA, BIL, um, all our old favorites and CMAC and Clean Cities. Uh, but we have a lot of work to do together, coordination across industry with government at every level. Um, there's, a, there's lots to do because we are trying to uh, scale the market and mature the market at the same time. So there are challenges. Um, and I am happy to be here today and answer your questions. Thank you, Genevieve. Uh, next, we'll hear from Chris Bliley. Chris is Senior Vice President of Regulatory Affairs at Growth Energy. Uh, thanks, Dan. It sounds like I'm on. Uh, growth, for those who don't know Growth Energy, we are the world's and nation's largest association of biofuel producers. Um, we represent 10.5% of the gasoline supply today is, is made with ethanol. Uh, and, you know, we are available for use for about 260 million vehicles on the road today. Um, as, as Genevieve said, there's a lot, a ton of growth in the EV market. Uh, but for decades to come, regardless of how aggressive we get in electrification, we will need sustainable solutions for legacy combustion vehicles. Uh, and we believe biofuels are a ready-made solution. Um, as I said, we're 10.5% of the liquid fuel supply today. Uh, with a simple switch to a 15% ethanol blend, we can drop uh, greenhouse gas emissions by 40 million tons, the equivalent of taking 10 million cars off the road, just like that. Um, it's a fuel that's 16 cents less per gallon, or it was last summer, and in some locations, a deeper savings than that. Um, significant greenhouse gas emissions, which I mentioned, as well as criteria pollutants. Um, in fact, Brittany mentioned um, a lot of ambition towards zero emission vehicles and fuels. I think that's an important notification because fuels are going to be an important component um, for the legacy fleet and for e even the additional uh, internal combustion engines that will be continue to be built. Um, that is a ready-made, you know, E15 is a blend that's available today, 3,200 locations. Um, as we look towards the future, in a, in, alongside of electrification, vehicle manufacturers can also take advantage of ethanol's high octane properties, a high octane mid-level ethanol blend. Um, we have pushed EPA on moving octane higher uh, for similar reasons. It's a cleaner fuel. It helps drive engine efficiency and helps achieve those decarbonization goals. Um, so that's looking out more towards the future. I, additionally, and I think what is probably exciting to many in the audience and exciting to our members, again, you know, a lot of push towards electrification in the on-road fleet. And so how do you decarbonize some of these harder to electrify sectors? So aviation, marine, um, biofuels are a solution there as well. Um, two of our members have announced commitments to make what would be 20% of the president's grand uh, challenge for sustainable aviation fuel. Uh, that's over a billion gallons of sustainable aviation fuel. But importantly, and I think everybody has talked about it, you need proper implementation of policies on the table. So we need a strong and growing renewable fuel standard that continues to drive investment in, in, in biofuels and sustainable biofuels. Uh, we also need a proper implementation of their Inflation Reduction Act. There's a lot of guidance out there yet to be determined on sustainable aviation credits, on clean fuel production credits. Our members are making capital intensive investments, billions of dollars of investments that they can't really make until there's clarity in, in those provisions. So it's really important that those things get done. Um, you know, we are available and scalable to meet some of these challenges in the road, in the road ahead. 
pardon the bad pun, um, both <laughs> for the on-road fleet and these hard to uh, electrify sectors. And I think there's a lot of excitement in our industry. Um, we know that you know we can be used and 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 really take advantage of the properties of a fuel that we make here in the United States, lowering carbon emissions, lowering criteria, pollutant emissions, um, and can be used in vehicles today, as well as vehicles, on-road vehicles of tomorrow, and as well as uh, aviation and marine. And with that, I will wrap there. Thanks, Chris. There's never a need to apologize for puns on any ESI panel, as long as I'm around. Maybe we'll have a pun off later. Um, that brings us to Art Gazzetti. Art is Vice President, Mobility Initiatives and Public Affairs at the American Public Transportation Association. Take it away, Art. Yeah, thank you, Daniel. And <clears throat> I'm glad we're ending the day with this connection between uh, transportation policy, environmental, and energy policy all linked together. I'm here to talk about uh, public transportation as a central uh, and fundamental strategy uh, at my organization, APTA, the American Public Transportation Association, is the National Association of Transit Systems. We've uh, been doing that since 1882, a lot of longevity and transitions along the way. So we, uh, we think we can face this current transition um, with glee. Um, and I say that enthusiastically. The, the president has challenged us. Um, you know, reduce greenhouse gas emissions by 50% by 2030. That's a heavy, uh, a heavy lift uh, to make. But fortunately, and you know, with transportation sector being the leading emitter now, so it's the place we need to look to for the uh, for the most improvements. Uh, fortunately, we've had some recent tools that we can put to work. Uh, the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act uh, provides a level of investment that can help uh, make a, a significant difference, at least address transportation policy, make changes in it, and make changes in the priorities and the way we invest in the communities that build around our systems. Um, also, the Inflation Reduction Act sends a market signal that the future is heading towards a, a clean energy economy. Now, the transit systems around the country, were, uh, while we deem ourselves to be inherently sustainable, we also practice to what we, what we preach to make sure we're adhering to all the practices uh, that uh, uh, improve our climate, climate footprint. In uh, two weeks, um, we'll have 800 people uh, gathered in Anaheim, California to talk about sustainability and our commitment to it. Uh, we have a sustainability commitment program where we make our transit system say we're going to adhere to A, B, C, and D, and we work with the Federal Transit Administration on their Sustainable Transit for a Healthy Planet initiative. Now, one thing we need to do, if we are going to, say, change the way uh, people travel and travel but in a more energy efficient way, uh, we have to make the, the energy efficient alternatives as attractive as can be. We need to make the transit option uh, convenient uh, and attractive. And I would say we need to uh, undo uh, decades of transportation policies and land development patterns that have favored automobile travel. And for too many Americans, uh, they have no choice. Um, so th that's the kind of uh, thing we're dealing with. As far as the funding, it's a federal, state, local uh, partnership. Um, the feds have stepped up, but we're pressing at the, at the state and local level. Um, we have a federal uh, transportation trust fund, which is good policy. It gives you the certainty to plan uh, and invest in a multi-year uh, time frame. Um, but we need to make sure we hold on, hold on to the gains that were made available through the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, uh, put those funds to work uh, to make a difference. Now, I'll uh, conclude with a final point I want to make. And while we're fully committed to the transition to zero emission uh, fleets. Uh, it comes with challenges that perhaps some saw and perhaps others did not. Um, uh, electrified buses have a range issue uh, that we, um, you know, uh, that means you need more buses to accommodate the same service, service patterns. Um, we also have worker training needs. We have safety needs. There's battery disposal issues. There's fleet procurement issues. Um, there's um, 
uh, facility retrofit. Uh, so it comes with all of those challenges that we're going to address in, in the coming years. Uh, but we're up for it. It's something we must do, and we'll all be better uh, for it. Uh, fortunately, I just saw in uh, CNBC yesterday a very encouraging report that the investments made available through the Infrastructure and Investment and Jobs Act create that certainty that there's funding here for industries to invest, invest in uh, transportation supply, invest in uh, the market signal, the market direction towards clean energy. Um, and thank you. Let's go. All right. All right. Thank you so much. Um, before we get to the moderated discussion, I'll just mention a couple quick things. One is that we just published a heavy-duty electric vehicle fact sheet. Um, that's something that's pretty new to our website. Uh, it's a couple weeks ago, I guess, maybe. Uh, it's a really great product. It's a two, all of our fact sheets are two pages, or the modern incarnation of our fact sheets are two pages. So it's a great resource. We also have one of our most popular resources is a sustainable aviation fuel issue brief. It is not two pages. Uh, you're going to learn a lot about sustainable aviation fuels if you pick that up. Thanks to Jeff Overton, uh, who's one of our policy fellows, He's put a ton of work into that. It's one of the best, uh, most popular products we have. Um, I'm going to transition to standing up so we can get into q and If folks in the room have questions, please feel free to raise your hand. Someone's wrangling. Oh, there it is. George has got one uh, in the back. Um, and uh, she's going to be moving the microphone around. I'd like to start with, I love this panel, and one of the reasons I love this panel is because we're able to bring sort of a diversity of perspectives, um, right? Sustainable transportation is its actually broader than that, right? It's sustainable mobility in some ways. And Brittany, I'd love to, since we've, it's been a little while since we've heard from you, maybe we could start with you and just go down the panel, but um, the challenges of climate change are big and multifaceted. There's room for everyone to offer their contributions, and I'd love to hear from each of our panelists about how the work your organization's doing is leveraging the work of the others, whether it's the others at the table today, or I know that this is, we only have four spots, the transportation sector is great, more diverse than this, but how you're leveraging the work that's being done from, a, a, you know, across the transportation sector. Uh, sure. Um, a lot of our work is thinking, looking, really connecting with DOT and DOE. Um, so, and, and connecting with a lot of the infrastructure, um, supply, supporting the infrastructure efforts associated with our clean school bus program, and now, hopefully next year, our ports program through IRA, uh, through some of that funding. Um, my team in particular, we don't necessarily work on the regulatory side of things, but I'm familiar with the regulatory aspect of things. We support a lot of the research associated um, with thinking about forward-leaning activities. Um, so keep in touch with what's happening in academia, we um, connect with many of the universities across the country who are working on sustainable transportation, uh, keeping up to date with um, what's happening in nonprofit sector and ind industries. We also have our mobile source, see acronyms are in interesting in government, MSTRS, which is our mobile source technical stern review committee, uh, which was assigned to provide EPA uh, with um, information related to mobile sources, so uh, research topics or suggestions of what the agency should be doing. They meet uh, once a year, or sometimes twice a year. This past year, we met. they met twice a year, uh, where they recently provided us with um, a mobility report, uh, which directly influenced how we're going to consider our implementation plan for the National Blueprint. And so that Stern Committee consists of folks from industry. Um, in this transportation space as well. So we try to look at um, all of our stakeholders. And then obviously the general public. Uh, folks can literally email uh, us, whether it be our clean school bus uh, at epa.gov email or our green vehicles at epa.email. Um, or if you have a direct contact as well, we are obligated to uh, respond to the public as well. Genevieve? Well, I think as... Um, we all have, and as the previous panel pointed out too, that um, this transition to clean energy and clean mobility is has so many stakeholders, so many facets in the silos between uh, power, equipment, vehicles, facilities, um, that those are, are evolving, if not breaking down. And uh, EDTA was actually formed to build consensus across these different industry sectors. Um, we've been doing it since 1989. I haven't been there since then. Um, 
but we have been working on this finding consensus of, among competitors and across industry segments, and we have to be moved together. It's, it's about innovation, it's about uh, markets, and it's about policy, and we need to have a shared vision in each of those areas because you have to um, evolve the technology, you have to expand what's available in the market and how consumers understand it, and you have to make a policy landscape that's predictable and consistent and actually is pointed in the right direction. Chris? Uh, before I forget, I'm actually a member of the MSTRS uh, committee that uh, Brittany mentioned, so we're very much working together with EPA in that, and I would, I, I'd echo the way she characterized it. It is a good opportunity for stakeholders across the board to engage the agency on transportation issues. Uh, it's not just industry per se, it's local governments, it's a lot of NGOs. Um, it, that's a very good example. Um, as Genevieve said, you know, I think a lot of us, uh, you know, are engaged in a lot of different policies, um, many of which are implemented by EPA, DOT, DOE, others. Um, and we all bring a, a different perspective, but I think, you know, ultimately we are all rowing towards decarbonization. Um, you know, we are not, we're in the liquid fuel space, but we are not anti-electric vehicle. You, but you have to have solutions for the existing fleet that you can electrify. Similarly, uh, you know, on the transit side, we would love for, you know, transit fleets to use biofuels. Uh, it is a great solution. Um, and so, you know, there are ways that we are working towards that. Um, and I, again, I think we all are supportive in different ways of differing policies. Uh, but I think we're all rowing in that same direction of how we can achieve those, you know, whatever the decarbonization goals are, be it, you know, our industry or be it the administration. And our yeah, I'm going to sort of uh, answer the question in a, in a very uh, almost in a way that's elegant in its simplicity. And that's that, yes, we're here, uh, the, the four of us, but it could extend beyond it to the many, many transportation organizations, uh, that we all have different constituencies, uh, but we all speak really to the same message of reduced emissions and an economy rooted in clean energy jobs. Right, we can all rally around that message. That's that's really ripe for the times. Uh, we've had a couple federal laws passed that embolden us and you know provide resources to us and market signals. Uh, I'll also say uh, on the governmental partner side, and I'll call attention to an effort uh, from the Department of Energy, Transportation, EPA, and HUD, uh, U.S. National Blueprint for Transportation Decarbonization and a, a, a nice document unveiled um, within the past year that I know my organization has rallied around, and it's a sort of a governmental effort. Let me mention them again. Department of Energy, Transportation, EPA, and HUD. HUD, interesting partner there. So, thank you. Uh, I think we have a question in the back of the room. Thank you. Uh, this is mostly a discussion on federal policy, so I apologize for bringing in the states. Um, but could any of you indicate to what extent states can seriously or have seriously um, changed the way they view this new kind of fuel of, 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 of a sense, sustainable fuel for our transportation? Are, are you getting a good sense that states, even those that may be, how shall I say this, net, not so inclined to necessarily um, be aggressive in climate, but understand that this is a new. This is the new way we're going to be um, rolling the wheels. Thank you. Feel free. Anyone would like to jump in? Please feel free. Uh, I can jump in. I mean, I, certainly on the fuel side, you have three states that have implemented a low carbon or clean fuel standard. Uh, California, uh, chief among them, and that has. A, I won't go into all the nuts and bolts, but essentially, you have to be you have to continually lower the carbon intensity of the fuel that you supply in the transportation fleet in those states. So for our members, we have invested heavily to do exactly that, reduce our industry's carbon intensity. On average, we're about a 50% reduction to, compared to gasoline, uh, but you know, with readily available technologies, we can get pretty close to net zero. 
Um, and we have members today who are producing cellulosic biofuel from kernel fiber, as an example. Um, but, you know, the West Coast has really driven sort of the fuel debate. Some of the other states are looking at that. Um, I, you know, there's also been states who've been involved on sort of vehicle requirements as well. Uh, a lot of the same states. Um, but I would say, I, I would say broadly, the debate on carbon, carbon intensity is definitely ramping up in the states. Uh, Genevieve, please feel free yeah, to weigh in. If I could, um, uh, did I do um, I'm just going to talk. Thank you. It's not just me. See? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Um, thank you. Um, as, as Chris said, so that there are... Um, States have a lot of various approaches, some carrots and some sticks. Obviously, California and its follower states are using sort of an emissions reduction approach to, to driving uh, changes in the transportation sector. There are also um, many states have incentives for uh, purchasing vehicles and for in infrastructure. I think it's also interesting at the same time, there are a lot of states, um, it's become increasingly popular, uh, to impose registration fees on electric vehicles, um, the rationale being to make up for lost uh, gas tax um, funds. But unfortunately, those numbers are set at sometimes three to four times what an internal combustion engine driver would pay annually in state gas taxes. So there's, um, there's incentives and penalties sometimes working um, in the same states. Uh, but I would say the um, they, they are um, a good portion of the states are, are looking forward, and all, all of the states have applied for and are working through the NEVI infrastructure funds, which are going to make a big difference in um, seeding and reinforcing in investment in infrastructure. I just want to add one thing from at least EPA's perspective for states um, uh, is, uh, you know, obviously, you know, California has done a lot in, in, in this space. So we brought up California um, uh, and, and thinking about sustainable transportation, clean fuels, uh, clean vehicles, zero emission technologies. One of the things we've been focused on outside of consumer education, including thinking about how do we educate the general public, how we interact with industry. But uh, uh, our office recently worked with another office within EPA, which is the state and local branch office, to do electrification webinars um, as states were looking for, reached out because they were looking just for general information. Some, some cases it would have been, help us to understand uh, uh, electrification as it relates to transit buses. Help us to understand electrification as it relates to school buses or the port sector. Or can you put us in contact with um, utilities from all, you know all across the country? So I think being in the, a federal partner in that way was helpful to kind of like kind of put everyone in the room to to give the states the resources they needed um, in that moment. So that's one area in which we try to support states and kind of um, especially those that are interested, I think, um, in moving in a certain path as we really try to think about transportation decarbonization. Art, I'd like to give you a chance to weigh in. If you uh, I'll, like I'll defer. I see some hands up, okay. so I'll defer. Great. Uh, Georgia, we have a question up here on the uh, front side of the column. Hi. Thank you all for being here. Um, I apologize. My question's twofold. Um, can any of you speak to the potential mitigation that's possible for environmental damages, as well as the emissions that take place for extraction and transportation of necessary materials like lithium and, and gallium um, necessary to build EVs and other electrical components? Um, and if we're not extracting much in the U.S., um, how is it benefiting our economy to extract in one place, haul to another destination, um, manufacture and then haul those um, that fleet to dealers um, domestically and are can biofuels uh, maybe find a, a space in hauling those materials thank you should I take the first crack of that? yeah yeah, that one yeah that's one. hello um, all right so I'll take a I'll take a crack at the first fold of that um, so in the critical materials supply chain, which you know we've seen versions of this in oil extraction. Um, every critical materials, rare earths, coal, oil, whatever we, um, whatever uh, material you want to extract, um, there is um, 
there's energy intensity and there's an environmental damage or impact that needs to be addressed. The difference in building the EV supply chain is the whole world is watching this. We are build, essentially building this from scratch and are required to do it cleaner, better, more sustainably, and to higher ethical standards than any of our predecessors have ever been uh, in, in this global trade. And to speak of global markets, is it's in fact, well, one, the, the impact of building the U.S. market brings supply chains closer. Um, and that's, that's the way markets work. That's why you're seeing battery facilities and refining facilities locating here because suppliers want to be closer to their customers. Uh, but at the same time, there is an absolute role for a global marketplace so that uh, there is a resilient, diverse, and innovating supply chain. We, don't, um, we do not need to and we should not be trying to fence off all of our industry into just our domestic suppliers. That is um, a recipe for uh, reliance, and it's not, in fact, economically or necessarily environmentally feasible. Sorry, what was the biofuels part of that? Uh, short answer is yes. Um, biofuels are used in both the light duty and heavy duty fleet. Uh, we're on the ethanol side, so more on the light duty side, but heavy-duty biodiesel, renewable diesel uh, are used today. I'll make a, a very quick comment on, on the good question, and that's that there is a, <clears throat> a management science. Uh, you know, we have a, a, the transit systems have an environmental systems management committee that deals with those kinds of issues and deals with them in a responsible way. So. Thank you. Uh, Brittany, did you have anything you wanted to add? Okay, great. Uh, question up here? Thanks. A, a poll that came out from Pew just earlier this week said that uh, for most Americans, the concerns about EVs at this point are not cost, they are not range, they are about charging infrastructure. And in particular, I would imagine that that is especially the case among the, shall we call them the ungaraged, people who do not have garages at their home, which is where a lot of folks tend to charge overnight, people who live in apartments, people who live in townhouses and only have street parking, et cetera, et cetera. So a question for Genevieve for sure, and maybe also for Brittany, is what is being done to help the ungaraged? Well, I, I don't know that I've ever heard the term ungaraged before, but I like it. It's good. It's good. Uh, uh, Charging and expanding access to charging is a central preoccupation of the industry, of the administration, uh, and to urban and rural planners, how do we get equitable and com comprehensive access to charging? And the answer is multifold. Uh, it, it will depend on each community, what sort of charging they need, what does it look like? Or is it multi-unit dwellings? And do you create uh, communal spaces where there is access to fast chargers? Is there increasing access to electrified transit and ride share? Or do we have uh, create more incentives for workplace charging? Because if you recall, I'm, I'm sure if you've read all this, um, that 80% of charging is home and work. Mm -hmm. um, well, I, for instance, I only charge at work. I am on garage. I charge at work. Mm -hmm. um, but creating more incentives for workplace charging, create, um, it's also in, it's down to the level of, of building codes and condominiums and allowing folks to add charging at condos. But it, it will be, will take state, local, and, and federal incentives. There's obviously, there's a federal incentive for uh, uh, build, installing infrastructure. That's residential and commercial infrastructure. That's, that's certainly a piece of the puzzle. But it also takes planning and investment in public charging, but also understanding what charging needs actually are and what perceived charging needs are, because those are not exactly the same. Yeah, I'll agree, like literally 100% of what she said, <laughs> Genevieve said. Um, I think, uh, you know, because of EVs 10 years ago were, were, were not as uh, uh, 
seen on the roads and people didn't have access to them as much. It was only a select few. Charging at home was probably ideal, maybe ten, five years ago at work um, because we didn't have necessarily have the infrastructure in the public roads. So one of the, that's one of the areas we actually are tracking because we want, that's how you assure that things are equitable and accessible to all um, who may not necessarily have a garage or um, a designated parking area where they can charge. Um, but um, how do you build out infrastructure? One of the ways we're saying that, we're saying that through Electrify America, um, which is a result of the VW settlement, um, where charging, public charge stations are being built all across the country. We're seeing that um, uh, when uh, figuring out what people's true needs are um, in, in terms of do you need to actually have it at home? Most people drive under 50 miles a day. Um, so with expected range, do you need to charge every day? Um, and the idea is to try to get charging as close as possible to folks' um, daily commute so that um, they could potentially charge anywhere, not necessarily at home. Um, the other thing is working with state and local governments. A lot of this is getting back down to the level of why we have the decarbonization blueprint, um, uh, uh, because it's going to require land use planning um, and how we build out communities um, as well. Uh, so. Um, we have obviously the federal tax incentive with the for, for actual EVs themselves, but a lot of states have implemented charging infrastructure um, incentives as well um, uh, for, for areas. For example, in D.C., you can do it in condominium areas. So it just varies on what the infrastructure needs are, but we are keeping tabs on that. Um, uh, out, outside of that, no, no additional funding necessarily has been put in place from EPA to incorporate this the installation of um, charging for ungaraged uh, homes, um, but it is something we're keeping track of. So we're just trying to really build out and, and see um, the building out of charging infrastructure really um, in areas that uh, we, we don't see it as much. And we have another question in the middle here. Thank you. Hi. Um, so are there obstacles for elect electric transit buses and school buses um, who are taking not only longer routes um, in rural areas, but also colder areas? And do you see this as an opportunity um, for low emission alternative fuel vehicles to be part of, um, you know, this overall goal here? Uh, well, um, I'll make a, a couple oh, comments on that. First of all, uh, yeah, low emissions are good, zero emissions are better. Uh, so that's, uh, 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 that's point one. Point two is there are it, it, big challenges. You mentioned cold weather, that is, that is, uh, that is true. Um, now there's also hydrogen. You know, we're talking a lot about electric, but hydrogen is a zero emission. Uh, there is a little mini wave uh, towards consideration of hydrogen. Um, as we also pursue uh, electric, electric options. Uh, and, the, and the question of range is another thing. Hopefully battery density is going to keep getting better. Uh, and that problem uh, we're going to overcome uh, over time. But you've identified a few challenges and we're up to address all of them as we do move to low and particularly zero emission fleets. Um, yeah, no, I, I, I agree with what with, with Art was saying. The other thing I was going to highlight, one of the things we're really seeing outside of, um, obviously there's some, some issues with cold, but we've seen a lot of areas where electric buses are flourishing in cold climates. Um, I think we also believe that there can be a diversity of technology options depending on the area's needs. What works in Minnesota might not work in Florida, vice versa. Um, so area by area varies. One of the bigger concerns actually has not been that, though. It has been infrastructure. Um, and then also, in some of our remote areas, we work a lot with our tribes um, uh, in more rural areas uh, as um, in, in our clean school bus program has been uh, when your bus breaks down, because every technology breaks down, just like your you know diesel school bus would um, in any case, there may not be someone who can work on the bus for 200 miles away. And so we have act actively working uh, now, we realized we needed to get involved with how folks are trained um, in this space to ensure that, um, hence job creations, I know we didn't talk a little bit about jobs, uh, where folks are trained in those areas to be able to support the needs of the um, technology as well. So that's been kind of more of the bigger concern um, in some of the more rural areas has been the infrastructure and then a challenge when a bus breaks down, you don't have anyone to work on it um, and then trying to kind of support the area where we're keeping track of where's 
what schools are actually producing folks that can actually work on these technologies to ensure they're in, in contact with the right areas and spaces where those, those skills are needed. All right. Uh, did you have a question? OK. Um, well, so you've been a trooper. You've been here all day. So you will get the last question of the day. Oh, boy. All right. Hi. Um, we've been talking about chargers. And when you talk about chargers, you're talking about electricity demand. And I know in some cases, there's concern that, you know, you can't get if you can't put a pile of fast chargers on the distribution system. The utilities just can't do it. Um, to what extent, you know, does the electric system have to be ready for the EV chargers? So it's absolutely the right question. And let's start with the, like, the first question is, what do utilities do? They plan for demand, right? So when the world got air conditioning, um, when the world started every Christmas getting 15 giant TVs, they plan for these increases in demand, uh, in, in building capacity, also in managing demand. That's going to be an, an enormous piece of adding uh, new load, new mobile load to the grid. At the same time, this new mobile load can be an asset to the grid managed properly. So it's not so much about new capacity, it's about at, like smart demand. Mm -hmm. uh, there is certainly, we've seen um, supply chain challenges. Tr the transformer supply chain has still not recovered from the unpleasantness of the last couple of years. So there are there are actual hardware pieces of this that we need to work on, and certainly there's planning. But between innovation, so that charging is smarter, batteries are more efficient, and you can access the value of batteries and make renewables more useful to the grid um, to en enable distributed resources more effectively. These are all parts of what it's, I think it's why we call it a transition to e-mobility. Um, it's not flicking a switch. We're going to build this ecosystem. Other comments on the panel? I just, um, Go ahead. 20 seconds. Yeah. Okay. Um, I was thinking, I've been in talks with utilities as of late, and usually the response we, we, we get is, we need folks to come to us first. So when it, what does that mean? Typically, it's when you have a thought. So before you buy the technology, um, when you have a thought, because they need that planning period. Uh, one utility in, in, in particular said, we're focused right now, our, our modeling system is using 2019 projections, projections we know change over time, and they can change drastically. So we need you to kind of help us be a part of that planning and planning out in advance um, to, to meet the needs because uh, usually those needs can be met if you come to us first and work together uh, before you kind of jump the gun and then say, now I, I need to have this uh, amount of power, I need to have this amount of access. Um, so using the joint office, we've been encouraging folks um, to work with utilities following outlines they've provided there. Um, thank you very, very much. Um, before we wrap the panel, I just wanted to give a shout out. There's a, he was just sitting there a second ago. Um, there's a clean fuels development uh, coalition uh, table in the back with some materials. Oh, there's Burl. There he is. Okay. Um, so check that out too. Um, get some, some good information back there as well. Brittany, Genevieve, Chris, and Art, thank you for being great panelists and for helping us get through a tremendous uh, policy forum at Expo. So round of applause for our panelists, please. Hey, Dan, do you think there'll be any ice at the reception? Well, I, I wanted to make sure we heard it. So I asked them, I, we mic'd them all right before. Um, yeah, yes, there will be ice. Um, and there will be crackers and cheeses and wines and beers. So I'd like to say thanks to everybody in, the, in our in-person audience for joining us today. Uh, thanks to everyone in our online audience on the live cast for joining us today as well. Thanks to all the panelists, to the exhibitors. Thanks to everyone on our ESI team. Huge thanks to Senator Reid and his staff and Senator Crapo and his staff for their assistance. Uh, the members of Congress who stopped by. We'll have more members of Congress stop by during the reception as well. So I hope everyone can join us. I think that's safe to say that we're wrapping the 26th annual uh, Congressional Renewable Energy and Energy Efficiency Expo and Policy Forum on a high note. So 
we know that they have ice. We should go, we should go use it. Uh, so thanks, everybody. Uh, we'll wrap there, and uh, we'll see you at the reception. Thanks. Thanks. Jeff.